John chapter 4. That's what we're here for. And it is exactly 12 p.m. Right now it is. And I did not time this. We're about to find a woman who come to the well at the sixth hour. Now, if you know anything about Jewish time, uh, the sixth hour is 12 noon. Amen. You hear the Bible in Acts, you know, 3 talk about they came to the temple at the third hour. That would have been 9 a.m. in the morning. Because the first hour is 6. They're day from 6 to 6. It, 6 in the morning, 6 in the afternoon. So the hour here that is 6th hour is 12 noon. So everybody say, welcome to the 6th hour. Amen. Amen. I promise you, now it's 1201. Praise God. Took me a minute to say that. I can tell time. Hallelujah. But this is the setting of what's about to happen with Jesus. Somebody say, with Jesus and one woman. Somebody say, he won this one woman and she won the whole city to him. Somebody say, the one revival. Yeah. A lot of folks is caught up in revival about crowds. Hello? Revival about big things. Amen. As far as numbers are concerned. But somebody say the one revival. That's what I want to preach to you about this morning because this one woman, Jesus won her to himself and she went into the whole city and won the whole city to him that day. Somebody say the one revival. So that means revival started with her. Everybody's running to somewhere where revival's happening with a bunch of people. And I say everybody, that's just a figure of speech. Everybody ain't doing that. But somebody say, you better be the one that gets revived. David said in Psalms 80 and verses 18, so that I'll not turn back from you again, quicken me that I might call on your name. Somebody say quicken me. The word quicken means to take something dead and make it live again. It's literally the word in scripture for revival. Psalms 138 verses 7, David said in the word of God, though I walk Amen. In trouble. He said in the midst of trouble, he said, yet revive me and stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies. David said, I'm walking in the midst of trouble, but God's going to revive me. Somebody say, revive me. Amen. A lot of people's hearing the word revival and they're just thinking crowds and massive, you know, groups of people. But somebody say, revive me. Somebody say, I need a me revival. I need to be revived. I need to be the one that stands before God, draws the circle around where I stand, and say, Lord, touch me. Revive me. Somebody say, it's possible to live revived. Live revived. I don't have to just go to some location. I have got to make sure my location is a habitation, a place I live with God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Where David said, quicken me so I can pray because I don't want to turn back. Psalms 80 verse 18. Literally, that's what it would translate. God, so I don't backslide, so I don't go back to the world, so I don't go back to sin. God, revive me. Amen. So I can pray. Somebody say real revival. Amen. Pray. God is about personal praying. It's about spending time with God. Somebody say those who walk and live in revival have a prayer life. Some people are attending revival services and still don't get a prayer life. They didn't get revived. Somebody say we must take responsibility for this personal revival, so to speak. Somebody say revive me. I call it the one revival. The one revival. One one got revived, and God used her to change the whole city that day. She went from being a prostitute to a prophetess to being a preacher in one afternoon. Think about it. Let's read what happens. In John chapter 4, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, verse 2 says, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Somebody say, This is the spirit of religion. The Pharisees said, Jesus is baptizing more people than John is. And somebody say, God's word said, Jesus didn't baptize nobody. Ain't it just how folks are? Well, you know, the Lord said, and the Lord ain't no more said nothing. Come on, I've had people leave church or stop from watching us online and say, well, he said, and you can go back and watch it. I ain't said no such a thing. 
I had a lady one night, she said, well, you called my name when you was preaching. I said, ma'am, go back and listen to the audio. Go back and watch the video. I don't even know you from Adam or his house cat. I don't know you. Hey, man, I don't know who your name is. Hey, man, I ain't never seen you in my life, but I don't doubt you didn't hear your name called. I said, the Lord called your name. You better answer. Amen. But ain't that something? That's amazing. The Pharisees, uh, Jesus had heard that they were going around saying, boy, he baptized more people than John. You know, Jesus did, Jesus did, Jesus did. And then uh, verses 2 said, Jesus didn't baptize nobody. Only his disciples baptized. Now, he told them to do it, but he didn't do it. He was baptized by John. Amen. In Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22. But Jesus never baptized one person. Somebody say, Jesus never baptized one person. Somebody say, Jesus didn't even need to be baptized. He was the Savior. He never knew no sin, did no sin. 1 Peter 2, 22. But yet he told his disciples, go into all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Amen. Praise the Lord God. In Matthew, I believe, uh, 28, uh, verses 18. So, uh, right here, in verses 2 said he didn't baptize anyone, only the disciples. It's amazing how people start spreading stuff around that Jesus didn't even do, that he didn't even say. That's religion. He left Judah. <laughs> That's how Jesus dealt with it. He just left. Hello? Somebody say he just departed. He just left. Jesus would often do that. People would be saying all kinds of crazy doing things. He just walk out. He just leave. Uh, and it says, verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. Somebody say, Jesus has a need. Wow. God of heaven and earth. The God of our salvation that put himself in flesh form, made himself a body, Hebrews 10, 5, placed it in a virgin womb of a woman named Mary, a teenage girl without the seed of a man and then was born nine months later, lived to be a man, never did any sin, preached for three years, cast out devils, healed the sick, raised the dead and forgave sin. Come on somebody. And then let them crucify him and raised himself from the dead and ascended back to God the Father with a promise to us saying, I'll be back. He said he had a need. Who had ever thought God needed something? He said, I must needs go through Samaria. Somebody say he was needing to preach to this one woman. How many people would skip lunch with the disciples down at Church's Chicken just to go reach one? I'm about to prove to you Jesus fasted for this one person. Though it don't say Jesus, you know, was fasting, it does say he didn't eat. We're about to find that out. Somebody say we miss some souls because we don't push back the plate. We don't fast. The modern church is too busy feasting. Come on, somebody. And if you're just waiting for a preacher to call a fast before you fast, you're missing times with God. You're missing God because I promise you, he's not just giving corporate fast through the, through the leader in the church. Come on, somebody. He's calling his saints constantly, amen, at different seasons and times. Somebody say, you won't die. I promise you. Tell them, say, you won't die. Amen. Your body will actually thank you. All right. L listen right here. It says, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, Samaria, uh, you talking about, you know, a religious animosity and, and contrary to each other. I mean, they worshiped all kind of gods there. So to the Jews and Samaritans, they weren't no getting along. Amen. But Jesus said, I'm going to go where I'm not welcomed. I'm going to go where they tell me you don't need to go. Ain't you glad he does that? I had a pastor tell me one night, I said, Brother, you don't want to go preaching that revival in that church. That church is dead. I wanted to say, Do. <laughs> Ed. <laughs> Do. Do. I said, Well, brother, I'm an evangelist and we preach revivals, and revival means to take something that used to be alive that's now dead and wick it back up. I said, It sounds like where I need to go. I remember years ago, this was in the 90s. I had church folks telling me, even I had law enforcement tell me one time, don't go down to Oak Street. I'm talking about here in Waycross, right at the heart of it. Don't go down there and preach. I went down there, somebody let me use their porch right on the walkway. They was harlots going behind buildings with, you know, people that were 
paying for them to be harlots. I mean, you were watching all this stuff going, drugs being sold, all kind of stuff going on. Hey man, I was out there singing and preaching and, and, and this harlot come out from behind the building and the Holy Ghost got on her. Hey man, and before it was over with, we cast demons, multiple demons out of her right there on the sidewalk. I saw her a week later walking all well, nicely dressed and she went down there where she was at. Amen. Come on, don't go there. Really? You know, the Jews would have told Jesus, don't you go there. You know, there was one time Jesus, I believe, was in Samaria in, in Luke 9. And in verse 51, it says his face was as he would go toward Jerusalem. And they didn't want nothing to do with him. They were mad at him because he was headed to Jerusalem. So there was a controversy going on all the time. Amen. I had a preacher, a pastor tell me one time, he said, well, brother, if you go there to preach, you won't be able to come to my church to preach no more. I said, well, brother, I don't guess I'll be back to your church to preach. And I told him, I said, you didn't die on the cross for me. I said, you don't tell me where to go preach and to who to preach to. The Holy Ghost does. I can't help you and them don't get along. Hello? Amen? Praise God. And I promise you, where he said I wasn't going to preach, I preached again. He weren't there. Preached more than one time, matter of faith. Come on, anybody here, Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. So Jesus was going somewhere religiously. This weren't, you know, the right thing to do. But somebody would say, Jesus ain't religion. He didn't come to start a religion. He come to start a righteous riot. <laughs> and to bring relationship with mankind and reconcile them back to God. Come on, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Everywhere Jesus went, he stirred up the religious crowds. Oh, he stirred up the traditions of men. They couldn't stand it because he come in. Amen. Praise God and stirred it all up. Just mixed it all up. Amen. And Jesus would touch people that people would say, don't touch them. Can't touch this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, Jesus, you can't touch this. Jesus said, watch this. <laughs> don't you touch the leopard and Jesus touch him. Somebody say, when you Mr. Clean, the original. Mr. Clean, you can touch anything unclean. What happens? You don't get dirty. It gets clean. Oh, glory. <laughs> Praise God. And I'm telling you, he would do things that people didn't want him to do. Religiously and tradition wise. And it says he cometh into the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Samaria means watch mountain. Sychar just means a, a lair. It actually means a drunken inn, a dead inn, so to speak. Somebody say Jesus has went to a watch mountain. Watch mountain meant prayer mountain. This place where people worship. They weren't worshiping Jehovah. They was worshiping all kind of God. There's was, was so much idolatry and witchcraft, all kind of stuff going on. Amen. Somebody say it was a dead end, but somebody say Jesus showed up. Somebody say that's where revival happened at. A bunch of munch, a bunch of munch. <laughs> that boy got hungry. <laughs> Ain't nothing but a bunch. Amen. Of idol worshipers. Drunken by unclean spirits, a dead end place spiritually. And that's where Jesus said, I got to go. I need to go there. Mm. Praise God. That's where he found many of us at. Ain't you glad Jesus went down your dead end? Yes. <laughs> and got you off your dead end. <laughs> got you alive in him, raised you up. He walked right past all the religious people and said, they ain't never going to get saved. They can't serve God. Boy, look at them old heathens. And then called you a heathen, not just a heathen. Them heathens, old devils ain't never going to change. going to always be like that. Ain't you glad Jesus just walked by them all and said, you don't see what I see. Oh, hallelujah, boy. He won't never amount to anything. Jesus said, watch me and pushes right through them and does the untraditional thing. Come on, somebody. Oh, glory to God. He went to our side car. He went our dead end and raised us up. Somebody says that's where he does things mighty. Uh, and it says on that parcel of ground near there and it's actually about Samaria had been about a north, a, a mile north, geographically north of, of Jacob's well that was on this parcel of ground that he gave to his son Joseph. And so there's a lot of traditions here. There's a lot of memories, even biblical, you know, connections from the old covenant now to the new. 
Amen. In this location, and it says, Now Jacob's well, in verses 6, was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Somebody say it was 12 noon. That was 15 minutes ago when I said that. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so Jesus sat on the well. Somebody say he was wearied with his journey. Now, he's the son of God, but he's the son of man. Somebody say he got tired. Somebody say Jesus got tired. He's got a body. He got tired. Just like me and you get tired. So when you get tired, Jesus said, I know how you feel. And he sat down. Somebody say he sat down. He had to rest. He had to take a break. And he was thirsty. Somebody say he was thirsty. But he had a thirst that was beyond just that of the flesh. The son of man part of him thirsted for the water that was in the well. But the son of God part of him was thirsting for the relationship, the fellowship with this one woman he knew that wouldn't come but at this time. He knew she weren't going to come with the early women early in the morning with the crowded women because of the lifestyle she lived. They would have judged her. They would have looked down on her. So she's going to come at noon when everybody's at lunch eating. They've done gathered their water early in the morning for their lunch. She's waiting to the hour itself when nobody's going to be there to come. Amen. And get it. And Jesus says, that's when I'm going to be there. He's thirsty. And you remember in, 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 in Acts, not Acts, but John chapter 19, I believe it's verse 34, when he's hanging on the cross, he said, I thirst. Remember that? He said, I thirst. Amen. And they brought to Jesus drudged wine. They brought to him a vinegar type mixture. Amen. That, uh, and, and, and it was sour. It was, it was not sweet at all. And Jesus even refused it because... Within it, it had mirth, which would numb. It would numb the lips, and eventually, if you got enough in the body, it would numb pain. So everybody say, Jesus refused it, even when he said, I thirst, because he weren't thirsty to get his pain numb or took away. He wanted to feel the complete pain because he was thirsting, not just for flesh. He was thirsting for souls. Some might say he was thirsting for humanity to know him. And this is where we see the first thirst he has. It's a portrait of the cross. Brother Rob, he surely could have took the bucket. Surely there was a bucket there, something. He could have gave himself a drink without waiting on her, but his thirst went more than that of the flesh. Somebody say, he's not only not eating, he's not drinking anything because he's thirsting for a woman. He's thirsting for this woman to know him. He's thirsty for it. Amen. And so there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Listen, verse 8 says, For his disciples were going away into the city to buy meat. Somebody say meat. That means food. Just like the church, ain't it? Jesus is trying to win somebody to himself, and the church has got to eat. Oh, we got to go eat, Lord. Service is too long, Jesus. All you're doing is sitting here on the well. Well, well. You've heard of Jonah in the well. This is Jesus in the well. Lord, you're taking too long at the well. You ain't even doing nothing. You're just sitting there. You ain't even saying nothing now. My God, we'll be back tonight for the evening service. We got to go get something to eat. Somebody say they left Jesus to go get something to eat. Don't believe people will do that. They'll do it. They'll do it every time. God's trying to move and boy, I wonder what we're going to eat. I ain't even hungry yet trying to figure out what we're going to eat. I was listening to the nurses in my daddy's, you know, um, hospital room while ago. He, he's trying to eat his breakfast and they're in there saying, what you want for lunch? What you want for the evening? They're trying to get his all fixed up. Amen. Hallelujah. And he didn't want none of it until they said hamburger and french fries. He said, oh yeah, I want that one. They went out. I said, you need to ask them, are they going to order it from Burger King? <laughs> Not the hospital, you know. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But they, you know, people just plan their whole day. Everything revolving around food. Amen. Jesus is there because he wants to win a soul. Amen. And he's not even drinking from the well. because He's, he's going to ask her because he's about to show us something really. He's more thirsty for her than he is the water that's in the well. Amen. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, Ask, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. In other words, I'm not just from Samaria. I'm a woman. That makes it even worse. Because they, in that culture, you know, women were degraded. They were put, you know, way down. 
they, they weren't allowed to do a lot of things. Amen. And, and there already was controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans. Amen. So she recognized him to be a Hebrew man, most likely because of the delete, the prayer shawl he probably was wearing. Because he would wear it. Amen. Praise God. And, uh, and so she knew where he was from immediately by, you know, casually looking at his attire and looking at him and seeing, you know, how he dressed. And she said, how is it that you want to talk with me and ask me a drink? I'm a woman from Samaria. He, he said, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She said, why are you dealing with me? Why are you talking to me? Y'all ain't supposed to talk to me. Somebody say that. That's Jesus for you. Ain't you glad he's for you? We know the folks saying, that's Jesus for you. Amen. Church folk won't talk to you, but Jesus will. Oh, church folk talk about you, but thank God Jesus will talk to you. He'll come after you. Glory. Somebody will just stop and have a Jesus praise break. Oh, praise him that he talked to you. Praise him that he come after you when nobody else would. Hallelujah. Y'all don't have any dealings with us, she said. And Jesus in verse 10 answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So Jesus is not there just to get a drink out of Jacob's well. Jesus is there to try to get this woman to drink from Jesus' well. That'll spring up into everlasting life. Somebody say living water. Wow. What a, listen to what the woman, the woman said to him, sir. And you're going to find her say this. Somebody say she didn't say savior. There's a lot of people you'll find they'll have respect for Jesus. They'll call him sir. They'll call him God, but they don't want to call him Lord. There's a lot of people that got respect and reverence for Jesus, but they don't live for him. They don't serve him. This woman's got respect for him. She calls him sir, but he's not her savior. You meet people like that all the time. Religiously, they got a respect. Oh, yeah, I honor the Lord. Yeah, I think I, yeah, it's Jesus that, yeah, I believe that it's Jesus that took care of us, but they don't live for him. They don't walk with him. They don't assemble at his house at the appointed time. They don't give to his work. They don't support what it is that he came to do for the preaching of this gospel so somebody else might could be saved. It's just about their miracle and whatever they need from God at the moment. Come on, the old sir, 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 but not Savior, Savior. Somebody say Jesus weren't there for her to just experience him as sir. He was wanting her to know him as savior. And there's a difference. There's somebody watching today. You know him as sir. You got respect for him. That's why you're watching this gospel being preached from this camera lens right here at Acts 29 Church of the God in Waycross, Georgia. But you don't know him as your savior. Hallelujah. You got respect to him. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I believe in him. But James 2 19 said demons believe and they tremble. They're still devils after they believe. That's why you don't live right after you say you believe in Jesus. Friend, he don't want to just be your sir. He just don't want to be somebody you reverence and respect casually. Praise God as long as it's convenient. He wants to be your savior. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants you to leave your sin. He wants you to come out of the world. He wants you to forsake that and follow him. He wants to be Jesus savior. Not just Jesus sir. She said sir thou has nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From which then hast thou living water? She's wanting to talk carnal things. Jesus is speaking spiritual things. He's not talking about Jacob's well. He's talking about Jesus' well, his well. The gift. Somebody say, if you knew the gift. He calls the water he wants to give gifts. Somebody say, it's the gift of salvation. Mm. Isaiah 12 and 3 talks about drawing water out of the wells of salvation. Somebody say, the wells of salvation. He's talking about something spiritual and she's wanting to talk just carnal things. That's what people do that don't know him as Savior. They just know him as Sir. They got some level of respect and all they do when they make reference of Jesus, it's about carnal things, about things that they need him to do for them. It's not about serving him. It's not about being his slave, his servant. Come on, and him being their master and them surrendering their all, leaving stuff behind to follow him, counting the cost, taking up the cross. Anybody here, Holy Spirit? Amen. And listen, she said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Some ought to say now she's getting caught up in traditions. Mm -hmm. Which gave us the well and drank therefore himself and his children and his cattle. Some ought to say she's caught up in carnality. She's, she's trying to talk carnal things and Jesus is speaking spiritual things. Because he said the words I speak unto you, they're spirit and their life. John 6, 63. And now she wants to talk traditional things. Carnal things, traditional things. Well, you, you ain't greater than Jacob. Jacob, did he want to made this well. Amen. I could hear Jesus though he didn't say nothing to her. And I made Jacob. I made the dirty Doug. 
I made the water to come up in the well. Top that one, girl. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, he ain't saying that. I'm just, you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine what God's thinking sometimes when folks are saying certain things? Kind of back like how the story started in John chapter 4, verses 1. All these Pharisees, boy, he's bap Jesus baptized more people than John is. And the Bible just went on, verse 2 said, Jesus didn't baptize nobody. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, you know, she's saying, are you greater than him? In verse 13, and Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinketh this water. Somebody say this water. He's like, girl, if you want to talk about this water, I'll just interject a little bit of, little bit of you know, substance here about this water. Since you think it's this water we're talking about, but this water is not what we're talking about. Somebody say, not this water, his water. Maybe. Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. So he's trying to let her know, I'm not talking about kernel water. I'm not talking about water that you know as water. I'm talking about something supernatural. I'm talking about salvation. I'm talking about a spiritual water, a living water. Water. But whosoever drinketh of the water I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into, here it is, everlasting life. Somebody say, Jesus is talking about spiritual water. She's talking about literal water. He's talking about spiritual water. And the woman said to him, she still ain't getting it, still caught up in her carnal mind. Sir, she still got that level of respect, but he's not Savior yet. Sir, give me this water. No, you should have said, give me your water. She's still thinking this water. She's still thinking it's the same water that's in Jacob's well. She's still thinking it's carnal stuff that he's trying to offer her. That I thirst not, even that statement. She's thinking, boy, I can get me a glass of this water and I won't ever get thirsty again. I won't ever need any more water. And he weren't talking about that. Neither come hither to draw. So there it is. She's talking about this water that's still in the well. She's, 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 she's confused. And Jesus saying to her, Jesus is like, all right, I've tried to offer you salvation. And let me tell you, this is how Jesus still offers salvation. This is how he still reaches sinners and brings them to faith in him. And they become his savior. And they leave even the religious level of respect where it's just sir. Jesus and become savior Jesus. He's like, I've tried to offer you a gift. I've tried to give you salvation. I've tried to show you what I'm here to do to give you. But seeing you don't get it, all you can call me is sir. The only way I know how to get you to understand I'm the savior, I'm going to have to reveal your sin. She couldn't know him as savior. All she would know him as was sir until he called her sin out. Listen to what he does. This is how Jesus brought about the one revival right here. And this one later that affected the whole city. Jesus said unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. In other words, go get your husband and y'all come back. Both of you. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast five husbands. That means you've been married five times. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In other words, the man you just left the bed with. Somebody say six. Somebody say it's the sixth hour. And Jesus says, just let this woman know you've had six men. Five of them you married. And the one you got now, you ain't even married to them. Oh, revival's over. No, it was just getting started. This is, this is the one revival folks don't want. <laughs> Somebody say, this is real revival. Jesus is just doing what he prophesied about the Holy Spirit in John 16. In verses 8, he said, when the Holy Ghost has come, the Spirit of truth has come, when he guides you in all truth, first thing he's going to do, verse 7 and 8 of John 16, he's going to reprove the world of sin. Why? So you can believe on him. So you can believe on him. Wow. Man, told that woman that. And then the woman said, unto her, Sir, somebody say, girl, still ain't getting it. Sir, it's third time, not Savior. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Ain't that amazing in that culture, in that day? Whether you were a Jew or not, they were so used to hearing prophets preach on sin, mama. When somebody spoke like this, they called them a prophet, not because they could prophesy. But because, not because they tell you some good thing that was coming for you, but they call your stuff out. Somebody say, that's a prophet. 
Yeah. Y'all heard the story about 1998 and I walked by that lady. God kept telling me and I kept trying. I said, Lord, I can't do that. I kept walking back and forth and finally I tried to get out of it. And I finally I stopped and asked the woman. I said, she's sitting third. Well, they weren't chairs. It was a pew. She was sitting third on that pew, that front pew, pew not pew, that pew. And I said, I said, ma'am, where's your husband at? She said, uh, uh, well, I'm not married. I said, well, uh, what, something about, in reference, I said, to, well, there was a man you was in the bed with that you got out of the bed to come here to church tonight with, and he ain't your husband either. And she just screamed and hit the floor and went to repent. When she first let out that first scream, I didn't tell y'all this, I about run. <laughs> I know what she was coming after me with. <laughs> she was, ah! A lady done that one night. I was in a revival. This is back like 2000. And, and I stopped and I said, God's healing somebody of a, something to do with your ear. He's opening your ear. And a lady, I ain't never heard a scream like that in my life. Son, I'm telling you, you, don't, you heard the statement, jump back. Marvin, jump back. I, did, I literally did just like it, about like with my, my cell phone the other day with the text message. It's got a train horn. I got to figure out how to get that off there. I was sitting there trying to fish, enjoying fishing. I said, oh, Lord, Brother Rob, about to make me jump out the boat. And, but she did. She's about to scare me to death. I, my Lord, 30 minutes later, I finally go over there. She's still on the floor, and she's making her way back up. And snot's everywhere, and she's crying. And, she, and what I didn't know, she was deaf. I think it was her right ear. She was deaf in her right ear. When I stopped, when I was preaching, said, God's opening somebody's ear. Her deaf ear opened. Literally, her deaf ear opened. She started hearing, and she screamed because she could hear. Ah! And I about left the stage. Oh, Lord. So the woman, here she goes again. Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. Neither come hither to draw again. I done read that hand. Praise God. I ain't where I need to be. So that woman that I told you about in 1998, kind of similar to what's going on here. This is the reference that come into my spirit when I started asking. And I didn't know that woman from Adam or his house cat either. Hallelujah. And the woman answered him and said, I have no husband. And then you know how Jesus told her what he did. And he said, woman, she, she said to him, sir, she's saying again, I perceived thou art a prophet. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And he say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye know not what you worship. But we know, here it is, for salvation is of the Jews. Some might say Jesus calls worship salvation. This is proof that Jesus is saying you can go to a worship service. You can worship on Watch Mountain in Samaria. You can worship in Jerusalem in the greatest cathedral and temple. But he said God's a spirit. He's about to go on. God's a spirit. Some might say he's preaching spiritual things. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And he's calling this worship salvation. Somebody say, you've not worshiped God until you can call him Savior. You can call him sir and say thank you. And a lot of people respectfully are doing that. But they're not following him. They've not repented of their sins and turned to follow him and left the world. Come on somebody. Somebody shout until he becomes savior. And we experience his salvation. It is not real worship until then. Hello? Even the demon possessed can worship him. In Mark 5 and 6, the Bible said in the word of the Lord, the man at Gadarene, he came when Jesus stepped out of the ship onto the seashore of Gad. Amen. It said that man that had legions of demons that run through the tombs, cutting himself naked, scaring everybody, they tried to bind him with fetters and chains and couldn't bind him. He'd break the chains supernaturally. Amen. And he runs to Jesus in Mark 5 and 6. And somebody say he falls down and he worships Jesus. Somebody say he had tens of thousands of devils in him and he could still sing a worship worship song. He could still say thank you God. Oh anybody anybody can go to a worship revival, a worship concert, a worship service. Oh many want to go to a worship service but when the word comes, when the, when the word comes out and the real prophet steps up amen and says where's your husband and he starts dealing with the sin. Hallelujah. Jesus calls this salvation. He calls this real worship. He said, well, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Somebody say, they'll be saved. They'll know him as Savior. Somebody say, that's worship in spirit 
And in truth, I heard one preacher one time trying to be important and revelatory, I guess. I, I don't, he'd watch too many pr TV preachers, I guess. He said, you can be in the spirit and not be in truth. That's all. Who let the mule out? That's crazy. Somebody say the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. John 16 and 13. If you're in the spirit, you're going to be in the truth. And if you're in the truth, you're going to be in the spirit. They are inseparable. They're married. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? That's crazy. In spirit and truth, true worshipers, it's salvation. It's, it's when somebody don't just know him respectively and sir, but they come to him and they turn from their sin and believe on him and now he's savior. This is salvation Jesus is speaking of. So, because he says God is a spirit because the whole time he's been talking about spiritual things, she's been wanting to talk carnal things, literal things. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Somebody say, I can't worship Jesus in spirit and in truth until Jesus is inside of me. I can't be in the spirit until the spirit's in me. I can't can't be in the truth until the truth, and he is the truth. John 14, 6, is in me. He's talking about the gift. If you only knew who it was talking to you and what he's trying to give you, you'd ask him for a drink. And she's asking him, but she's still asking for Jacob's word. She ought to know Jesus ain't drunk from it. He's trying to get her to give him a drink of it. He weren't talking about that water. He meant, think, girl, just think. She ain't thinking. All right, verse 25, and the woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh. Somebody say she's heard a preacher preach. Which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Somebody say, duh. He just told you all things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And then you got religions of this earth that are false saying Jesus never claimed to be Christ. Never claimed to be equal with God. When Philippians 2, 9 says he did just that. He thought it not robbery. Right here, he's saying it bold and loud. Heard a Sunday school teacher in a Pentecostal church years ago teaching it. Jesus never made a reference to himself. You know, he kept people to, told him to keep silent about it, not to say nothing. He never said that he, you know, he was the actual Christ or the... Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And, 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 and that was one of them Sunday school classes where they opened the floor. Needless to say, the floor got crushed because I went quoting from here. What you going to do with that? He didn't come secretly hiding behind something like he weren't who he was. He told them. He told this woman, this is who I am. And upon this came his disciples. Somebody say, right at this moment, here comes the church back. Their bellies is swole. They've been to pop bellies. Their bellies is popped. Come on, somebody. Uh, their mind's casually on God, and their belly is full of gas. <laughs> I mean, they, they, here they are, back swole up, but it's over. They filled up. They've come back. And Jesus is in the moment where he's about to lead this woman to himself. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Ain't just like church folks. Ain't got no concern for a lost person. All it's about is another church service. Oh, go get us a good word from God. Learn something more about Jesus. And woo go to the Chinese restaurant. Don't, don't get offended if you, I ain't saying don't go there. I feel led today myself. Hallelujah. Hey, don't, don't go to here. Don't go. No, but that's, you just see they're carnal. Jesus is there winning us all and all they're thinking about, well, we was with Jesus this morning. We're coming back tonight. We done filled up. We're going to get relaxed. We're going to sit on the well. Well, hey man, with Jesus for a while until service begins tonight. Hey man, with no concern. They, none of them ask, what, what are you seeking? What are you doing? Why well, ain't just like church people today? No concern. Don't bother them if they don't see somebody get saved. Don't bother them if they don't see a prayer get answered, if somebody gets touched or not. Their approach to God's house is just about them. Well, I'm a going church. But they never think about nobody else, nothing else. Amen. But themselves when they go to God. Amen. And so Jesus is revealing this here. He said, where was that? Oh, right down here. Yeah. What, none of them said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? None of them even was concerned of her. Had no concern with her. 
They're probably getting ready to lay down on the well or around it and take a nap. <laughs> the woman then left the water pot. Somebody say, when you meet Jesus, you'll leave the pot. It's amazing what you'll leave. And went her way into the city and saith to the men, Lord, you know what that literally means? That means first to the men <laughs> that she's been with. Oh, God, can you see her walking into somebody's house? Preaching the gospel to them, preaching them to them about a man that just told her everything. Because that's what's about to go. She said, come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? That was a confession that she just believed on him. She believed he was Christ. Somebody say salvation's hit her soul. She ain't ashamed of nobody now. She, she, she's going to everybody. She was ashamed to be with anybody until she met Jesus. Somebody say, when you meet Jesus, don't worry about Sister Sandpaper and Brother Bumpus Gums and Bucket Mouth. Let them talk their trash. Let them speak about your past. Uh, let them bring up about who you used to be. Uh, unashamed. Somebody shout, he took the shame. Uh, oh, and he changed everything. Remember the song we sang earlier? Come on, somebody. Uh, if Jesus washed it away, it's washed. Uh, oh, don't worry about what they say. Uh, some folks ain't going to never forget it. Uh, some some folks ain't going to never let it die, but it died when you come to him. Somebody shout, it's been buried. My past. No oh, glory to God. She said, come and see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is this not Christ? Then they went out of the city and they came unto him. Whew. Somebody say the one revival. One woman got saved and went and told everybody she come in contact with about Jesus. You know, and I say she went from being a prostitute to a preacher, but she wasn't even a preacher. She just told him, he's the Christ. This is the one. He told me everything I ever did, and I didn't tell him nothing. But ain't that just like Jesus? Not only did he tell me all about my sins, he told it to me so he could offer me this water. So he could wash them all away. Oh, so I could, somebody shout she'd been with six men. Five of them she'd been married to. This woman was guilty of adultery. You hear me? She was guilty of adultery more than once. She, she, and now she's fornicating. She's got a man. Jesus done revealed it. This ain't even your husband you got with you now. Somebody say six men. But somebody say that day at Jacob's well, she met the seventh one. Seven is the number of completion. Oh, Christ, in him we're complete. Colossians 2.10. Somebody shout in every relationship she had ever had. She still left empty, still left wanting. But when she met Jesus, she finally got fixed. She finally got complete. Oh, somebody hear the Holy Ghost. There ain't but one relationship this side of eternity that'll complete you, fulfill you, satisfy you. And it's with Jesus. Oh, glory to God. And it says, in the meanwhile, that means <laughs> this was a, I don't know, this would have been a, a time of just ease, I guess, for the disciples. They probably were napping, I don't know. It says, and in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. They still ain't said nothing about the woman. Some might say they can't win nobody to Jesus because they're too busy thinking about eating. Jesus still ain't ate. He ain't ate nothing all day. He ain't even drunk nothing yet. And they still talking about eating. Now Jesus is about to preach to the choir. He done won somebody to him and she's going out doing what they're supposed to do. And she's winning a whole city. These people come about on their way to meet him and know him. Amen, because of her knowing him. And, and here they are all cozy and wanting to know Jesus. You want something to eat? Think they're doing something, you know, saying something great. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Jesus told them, say, I got food you don't know nothing about. I'm sad to say the modern church, 98% of it, this is food that she knows nothing about. It ain't just about me and mine. It's about me reaching somebody else for him. Hallelujah. Therefore said the disciples one to another. 
hath any man brought him all to eat? They just as carnal as she was. Y'all, you what it means? They say, John, did you bring Jesus something? Thank you, you, Peter. Hey, y'all, they're talking among them. Andrew, you, you bring Jesus one of them Zaxby's chicken plates. Oh, no, that sounds good to you, brother. Man. Watch out now. I heard it growling at me. Now, I'm just joking. Hallelujah. Amen. Did y'all bring him something to eat? But he said unto them again, I have meat that you know of. And they're asking one to another, Did y'all bring him something to eat? And Jesus, you know, knowing their hearts, anyhow, saith unto them, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus right here described doing God's will, God's work, which is the cross, which is reaching the lost. Come on. He called that food. In that sense, the modern church fasts a lot, this food. Hello? They're hanging out around Jesus and it's just about them and Jesus. They never ask one question about the woman. But Sunday they ask about the food, not the soul. Somebody say they don't ask for the soul food. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 35. Say not ye there are four months and then comes the harvest. Somebody say behold. Somebody say look at him. See it. I say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields. That's why I believe they're about to sleep. Hey, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields for they're already, you know, they're white already under harvest. I believe in this moment it don't say so, but I believe that woman was on her way back and there was a crowd following her. And Jesus is telling them, all they're thinking about is eating and drinking and waiting around for the evening service with Jesus. And Jesus done one, one woman and she's on her way back leading people to where he is. And he's saying, look, look at the harvest. Lift up your eyes. That means they weren't looking for it. They weren't expecting. A lot of God's people is the same way. They don't come to church expecting a harvest, see somebody get saved. They, they, they're not thinking about it all during the week. Most, let me tell you the majority of what, hey amen, modern saints do. All they think about is, oh, I hope I can make it. And then when I get there, I hope the preacher gets something to me good. Makes, it gets me encouraged. And, and it's just about my personal miracle, my personal prophecy. And oh, I wonder if I can keep myself, keep myself encouraged. And somebody help me, touch me, help me, Lord, blah, blah, blah. blah. Somebody say, we need to start saying revive me. Hey man, we need to be like the woman at the well. We need to get touched. Somebody say we need to get in the spirit again. Hallelujah. And say Lord give me something to drink that I can't buy down at the local restaurant. I need, I need something to drink that'll spring up in me. Come on somebody that'll make me like this woman that when I leave from where you at, I, I gotta go find somebody else to bring to you. I gotta go. Somebody say if we don't evangelize we'll fossilize. This woman showed us how to evangelize. Somebody say she met Jesus. Well, brother, I didn't go to school. Neither did she. She had a testimony, though. He told me everything I did, and he still gave me something to drink. Yeah. And he still forgave me of my sins. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Notice when she left Jesus, it didn't say she went back to that man, that six man. No, somebody said she left that sin. She went to all men and went to begin to preach to them and tell them and testify. Hey Amen. Praise God and be a witness. And listen by verses 39. I love this. It said, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. That means Jesus. For the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. She won all them people to Jesus. She hadn't been to cemetery, I mean seminary. Hello? Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, somebody say when they come to Jesus, they besought him that he would tarry with them. They wanted him to stay. They weren't like the disciples trying to leave, go get something to eat. Somebody said they wanted to tarry. Oh, they couldn't get enough of him. Huh? And he abode there two days. Them disciples just waiting on evening service. It turned into a three-day revival. <laughs> Golly, with no break. All right. And I love this scripture, verse 41 of John 4, and many more believed on him of his own word. That means some of them didn't believe, but when they got there, Jesus preached to them. Probably preached the same message he did to this woman. Many more believed on him. I told a Gideon one time that come to a church. He was, you know, sharing about what the Gideons do. And remember when they placed Bibles in schools. This is how far back this has been. I walked up to him and testified afterwards. 
And I said, you know, when I was in the fifth grade, I got a little Red Gideon Bible. I said I was 18 when I opened it. I said I had to take weights and put on either side. It was still that new. I said, and I got saved reading out of the book of Revelation. I gave my life to Christ, and I said, I've been preaching the gospel for many years now. Amen. And uh, I said, so I'm like the Samaritans that came to him because of his own words. It weren't somebody else's testimony, but it was the scriptures. It was that that was written out of that little Gideon by all its tears come up in that Gideon's eyes. Hallelujah. He said, man, I've never thought of that this way. He said, you mind me sharing that next time my place I go? I said, share it. I said, I ain't got no originals. I said, that's straight from the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's the power of his word. See, you ain't got to be a preacher. Just bring him to where he's at. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, if all we're doing is going to church week in and week out, and all we're doing is thinking about where we're going to go to eat between services, and we're not thinking about souls. We're not thinking about that one person. That one, Come on, somebody. That one soul. Somebody say the one revival. Somebody shout, when we get revived, that's what we'll be concerned about. We'll be concerned about becoming witnesses, sharing Jesus with somebody we meet. It's just as easy as Jesus loves you when you're checking out and you're putting your money on the counter and you're starting to leave. Amen. And most people saying, have a good day, good afternoon. Some don't. Some don't say nothing. Some look at you like they wish you'd leave. Amen. Tell them to. Remember, tell, tell yeah. in-laws. Come on, somebody. Outlaws, it don't matter. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Tell them all. Somebody say, tell them all. Jesus loves you. Dylan shared about, you know, uh, a couple of days ago when he bought something, Saturday, I believe it was, not a couple of days, but yesterday, and it, it was $6.66. He was talking about that in the School of the Spirit this morning when he was teaching, and how he told the woman he just rounded up to seven because he's complete, you know, in Jesus, and seven's the number complete, and he ain't worried about that number. Amen. Concern. Years ago, that literally happened to me. I was in a revival, and it was late at night, and it was five or six people behind me in line. I walk up to the counter. The lady rings it up. And it's happened more than once. This is the first time that it ever happened. So it just sticks in my memory real well. Amen. And, and it rung up $6.66. You ought to have heard that lady. She screamed. Yeah! You thought somebody. I don't know what it is about screaming women here, lady. Amen. Just. Yeah! I thought, oh, God, man, and, and, and men, am I right? It can be a woman or a child. It's, it's something in a man's nature. It wasn't in that. Yeah. Oh. I don't know what it is. Y'all men looking at me like, oh, ain't me, man. No, we know you won't nod because she's looking at you, but you go ahead and y'all know you lied. And you lied and through your noddingless. I mean, the screech of a child or a screech of a woman, or something. It's like, it's like somebody taking a, and don't, don't you ever do it around me. It's like taking the fingernails to a chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, and that woman did that. I can even hear it on a TV in another room, and I finally go in there and say, y'all have to turn that down. I can't stand that. It's, uh, this goes up my part of my backbone, I guess, all the way up into my. And uh, amen. And she let out one of them old panther screams, like, ah! and she jumped back, and the people behind me like, like this. And I said, "Ma'am, you okay?" She said, "You got to go buy something else." She said, "Here, I'll, I'll buy it for you." I said, "What for? I don't want nothing else." She said, "It's six dollars and sixty-six cents." I said, "And." I said, I'm married to a woman that was born 6, 6, 68. She said, really? I said, yeah, really. I said, ma'am, I ain't worried about that. And I said, that's all that is, is a number to me. I said, because in Revelation 13, that's when that number is going to be given out, either in your forehead or in your hand, a marker. You won't be able to buy or sell, and you're going to have to deny Christ in his gospel, and you're going to have to, you know, salute to the Antichrist. I said, but in Revelation 4, the rapture's done happen. Amen. And in Revelation 5, all the saints are around the throne of God. I said, so I won't be here when that number is gave out. I said, are you ready? Are you saved? Are you going to be here? I said, that's just a number to me. Oh, glory to God because Jesus is my Lord and I'll be gone. Needless yeah. to say, <laughs> it take me long and get my stuff paid for and get gone. Amen. I was preaching to everybody. 
She said, okay, I understand now. I said, man, I said, you, you just need to make sure you're right with God. Amen. Praise God. And you won't have to be here when that's gave. Well, brother, is it secretly going to be given to us in a, in a vaccine? Or is it going to be in there? It, it literally says in Revelation 13, it'll be visible. You'll be able to see it. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. On. Amen. And somebody say, that's after. The rapture's already happened. We're going to get into that for long. I'm going to get into some more of this stuff. Hallelujah. Amen. But this woman met Jesus because Jesus weren't like his own followers. I want us to ask that question when we come to the altar this morning. Am I really like Jesus? I know I'm one of his followers. It didn't say they weren't his disciples. It said they were his disciples. But are we really thinking like Jesus thinks? Or are we just doing like they were doing? Hanging out with Jesus in the morning and the evening and in between eating and no thought to even ask him about a lost soul, about that woman, about what he was talking to her about, what it was all about. And we get caught up in that. It's called religion. It's called traditions of men. Some might say even that can become a tradition. Even that can be a manifestation of carnality where church is just about us. I'm going to get my thing. I'm going to get my blessing. But am I going, amen, to get in touch and in tune with God so I can reach somebody else? Somebody say, this is where we come get filled so we can go out into the fields. Come on, somebody. Lift up your eyes with me this morning. There's a whole field out there, and it's ready. It's ready. Somebody say, it's ready. It's white. That's why when you go out of this sanctuary through the foyer, Luke 14, 23, is right up there. It says, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Somebody say, come and go. A lot of saints are just coming and going, and that's all they're doing. He says, come here. Go there. Well, brother, I'm going where they're at. But if you ain't compelling them to come in, some people say, well, I'm going for the Lord, but they don't ever come to the Lord. Somebody say coming is what we do first. Somebody say this is the great coming, and you got to practice that before you can go do the great commission. There's a great coming before there's a great commission. And a lot of people don't want to come to the house. People don't want to come to his house. How are they going to compel people to come into his house when they themselves don't even come to his house? They're out of order. Amen. They ain't thinking like Jesus. Hallelujah. Brian, I don't know what's back there. Play it. Come to these altars and ask the Lord to show you who you're missing. Hey, somebody around you. And ask the Lord, who's watching me? Who's, who's? Lord, without you, I couldn't wake each morning. And Lord, without you, I couldn't sleep in peace each night. And Lord, without you, I couldn't go on another moment. Oh no, there's no use in going on without you by my side. Cause Lord, you. to me. Holy my God, like a desert in need of water. Lord, like a sailor in need of the sea. 
like a story in need of an author message I've looked at it this morning because of me saying it was the sixth hour when Jesus told the woman at the well and preached to her and that was being noon, high noon so it was literally 12 o'clock it's 102 right now, I was through a few minutes ago this message was 55 minutes long and I hear the Holy Ghost saying I want you to challenge my people take 55 minutes sometime this week and pray not for yourself but for somebody else to be saved and God use you to bring them like she did because his word will do the work amen somebody say just 55 minutes you may want to do it each day but go ahead and schedule your time or lest we be like the disciples who didn't even ask him why he was talking to the one. All they was thinking about was Jesus in the morning. It's noon time. Let's go eat something. Jesus in the evening. And then when they come back, they don't even ask him why he's talking to that woman. They have no thought of a lost soul. We want Somebody say, we need this one revival. The thought of just reaching one. One for the glory of God to bring to Jesus. The worth of just winning one. That's revival. Amen. Over and over again, she kept calling the Savior, sir. She'd say, sir, sir, sir. Somebody would say that's her level of respect. But she didn't know him as Savior. I'm going to tell you, that's the majority of the people in the hour we're witnessing to. And we're trying to lead to Jesus. They've been trapped in a tradition like she was as a Samaritan. They've, they're in Sychar, they're in the dead end. They, and they have a reverence for Jesus. They'll call him sir, but they still don't know him as Savior. Amen. Start praying for that one in particular. I'm not talking about just the heathen. Yeah, pray for them. I'm talking about the people who religiously think because they say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, that they okay. I might say they know him as sir, but not savior. That's what Jesus was trying to tell them. God's a spirit, and if you're going to worship him, just worship him in spirit and truth. And the water I'm trying to give to you will spring up into you is salvation. So Jesus was saying, you've not worshipped me in spirit and truth until my spirit and truth is coming in you until you've been saved. Some ought to say it's only true worship when they're saved. A lot of people are worshiping him with their lips and their mouth. They're saying something, but he's not their Lord. He's just sir. 
They got respect religiously, a religious respect to him, but they've not given their life to him. That's the ones we need to target in prayer like that for, because there's a spiritual, religious stronghold over their mind. They think they're okay with them. Them's the hardest ones to win. But I'll go ahead and declare, God, them's the ones we're about to win. In the name of Jesus. Shalabarondo Basaya. Hallelujah.